So hello, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Looks like we have a pretty good crowd. Kira, Luke T, Omar, Matthew, and Zoe. Good morning to everybody. I hope you had a great weekend. Hope you're ready for week 15. We are finally done with this semester. I can't believe it. All we've got left is one more homework and one more uh, exam, and you will be done with this class and one more discussion. Board. So the last week, I know it's been a long week, a long semester, Ariel. Uh, good to see you, but uh, we are finally here. My throat's feeling a little bit sore today, so if I'm not speaking loud enough, please let me know, and I will uh, try to speak up. Okay, yeah, my volume looks like it's pretty good on the computer here. Um, I will not be having class on Wednesday. I will be going with a recording on Wednesday. I have a doctor's appointment. Uh, over in Chapel Hill, so I will not be available Wednesday. So just put that down, uh, write that down, if you will, somewhere or remember it. Uh, I will put a, make a recording available for the week 15 lecture in the lecture of May, and it'll be available today after class. Everybody understand? Hi, Fawn. Good to see you, Phoebe. Good to see you. So this will be the live, la the last live lecture of the semester. Let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, chapter 15 is all about treating psychological disorders. So, last week we talked about what a psychological disorder was, how we diagnose them, how we use differential diagnosis, what the, char the main characteristics of a psychological disorder were. Uh, chapter 15 talks about how psychological disorders are treated. So, who treats psychological disorders? Three broad approaches to treatment and cognitive behavioral therapy. That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay? If you remember from last week, I mentioned to you that there are three different kinds of treatment professionals out there. There are psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, and counseling psychologists. Remember I said that psychiatrists are actually medical doctors who go to medical school and then do a specific psychiatric rotation. And um, they learn how to treat people with neurological-based disorders, the more severe psychiatric disorders. Um, now they have an MD, and they are the only ones who can uh, who can give out prescriptions for drug medications. On the other hand, clinical psychologists are strictly psychologists, but they go to graduate school and get a PhD in psychology. Instead of having an MD in medicine, they have a PhD in psychology, okay? Uh, they may either research in uh, university settings or some of them treat clients in hospitals or other clinical uh, settings. So you will find psychiatrists mostly in hospitals and larger institutions. Clinical psychologists can be found in uh, hospitals, but they also set up private practices as well. And counseling psychologists uh, they also have PhDs. They're psychologists just like clinical psychologists. But instead of working on psychiatric disorders, they usually work on what are called adjustment and life stress problems. So you may need a, a, a school counselor. You may need a family counselor. Uh, you may need a relationship counselor. Um, and so counseling psychologists typically uh, don't treat uh, borderline personality or anxiety disorders. They instead treat uh, situational problems. Top of the morning to you, Ryan. And that's okay, Caitlin. You are not late. You are right on time. Thank you for coming. Okay, so those are the different types of therapists. Now, how do we uh, treat psychological disorders? Uh, now, really, uh, we've been talking about psychology um, in different areas of psychology all semester. And treatment types come out of basic research. So in a sense, we've already talked about how treatments are going to be uh, followed through with, uh, with people who have psychiatric disorders or psychological disorders. If you remember in uh, chapter two, we talked about uh, biopsychology. We talked about neurotransmitters, we talk about localized areas of brain functioning, and uh, no, this is not a final review, Ryan. 
I'm just kind of walking into today's lecture. So really, um, if the brain is composed of neurotransmitters, synapses, and brain areas, then one way to treat psychological disorders is to treat them as biological problems. And so the biological approach uh, says that psychiatric disorders are a neurophysiological problem. And it has something to do with synaptic or neurotransmitter problems. In this case, we treat uh, people with drugs. Um, or it might be something going on wrong with a uh, different part of your brain. So we may have to take a part of the brain out. We may have to stimulate a part of the brain. Um, or in some other way support this type of brain. Now we're going to talk about the biological approach on Wednesday. Okay, on Wednesday. Now, chapter 6 and chapter 7 also form the bedrock basis of most uh, successful psychological treatments. Most of you who have been to a psychologist, they've probably uh, fallen, fallen in with a psychologist who treats people using either the behavioral or the cognitive approach. If you remember, we suggested in chapter 6 uh, that people learn behaviors through reinforcement and classical conditioning. The behavioral approach to psychiatric treatment says that the problem was learned, and so we have to reverse that particular learning. I don't know if any of you remember uh, when we talked about little Albert. Uh, John Watson trained little Albert to have a phobia using classical condition, conditioning. Remember, every time you put a little white rat in front of uh, little Albert, he would bang a loud gong and scare Albert. And after a while, Albert began to associate fear with the little white rat and became developed a phobia of white furry things. So, uh, in chapter 6, we talked about how psychological problems can be learned. Um, so, one way in which clinical psychologists try to help us uh, with psychiatric problems, yes, Ryan, is to help us unlearn those problems. And then in chapter 7, 11, 12, and 13, we talked about how mindset affects people's uh, thinking, uh, behavior, and, and uh, we, how uh, mindset is important to people. Um, you know, in chapter 7, we talked about cognitive psychology in general and this idea of thoughts and short term and long term memory. Um, in chapter 11, uh, and uh, 12, we talked about how stress and mindset affect stress, which affects our functioning. And in chapter 13, we talked about personality, which is just a set of cognitions that you have about yourself. So uh, the cognitive approach to psychological problems suggests that people have maladaptive ways of thinking. And so what we do is we engage these people in talk therapy or psychotherapy, and we try to help them work through these problems in thinking. Uh, we say that people may have negative or self-defeating schemas or association networks, and we have to help them. Uh, we have to help uh, uh, people develop more uh, successful uh, schemas and association networks. If you remember from chapter 11, schemas tell us whether or not we can handle stress. Uh, if you remember in chapter 12, psych social psychology, we talked about how schemas uh, uh, affect how we make attributions about the world, right? And then, uh, again, we talked about the self as a set of cognitions or thoughts or beliefs. And so um, what we have to do is we have to help people uh, resolve these mental conflicts or undo uh, these uh, less successful psychological habits of thinking. Now, uh, on table 15.1 in your textbook, it talks about these six approaches to psychotherapy, which is down here in this cognitive psychology. And we're going to kind of wrap behavioral and cognitive psychology in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, psychotherapy. Okay, so there are six different approaches to, psycho to psychotherapy. Now, um, there's psychodynamic therapy, uh, which is where we help uh, clients come, uh, un, uh, come to the realization about unresolved subconscious conflicts that they have. Maybe there's some hatred for, for one or both of your parents that drives your behavior. 
maybe you were truly embarrassed as a child and you have to work through a traumatic event. Uh, you might have been abused either sexually or physically or verbally. Uh, and we have to help you overcome the conflicts and the uh, secret locks that you have in your uh, mind that affect you. Uh, humanistic therapy sort of, if you remember, takes a different approach. And what we do is we just try to help people break out of their shell and fulfill their potential for personal growth. Now, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to focus my time on behavioral and cognitive therapy, and specifically a branch of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. Have any of you heard of CBT before? CBT therapy. I'll bet you some of you have. <clears throat> cognitive behavioral therapy. It's all the rage in psychotherapy, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what almost every psychotherapist is doing, cognitive behavioral therapy. There are a few psychodynamic therapists out there. Uh, there are even fewer humanistic therapists out there. Um, but the ones that are doing most of the work are going to be engaging in cognitive behavioral therapy. So what I'm going to do is focus on behavioral therapy and cognitive therapy today. Now, if you remember, if you remember, uh, uh, I suggested to you that uh, human beings can learn phobias, anxieties, and fears by repeated negative uh, pairings with repeated ne repeated pairings with negative stimuli. So, if you uh, try to go swimming and you almost drown, that's a negative exposure to to water, which may affect. Uh, how you think about swimming. Um, if you uh, are bitten by two or three dogs, you may develop a phobic response to dogs. Um, and so uh, we can learn through classical conditioning to have phobias or anxieties. Um, anxieties. Uh, uh, are, are, are learned through behavioral uh, means, classical conditioning. And so there are really two uh, type, two broad, uh, uh, three broad theories, let's say, of actually two broad theories, uh, exposure and therapy, which is called exposure and response therapy, and systematic desensitization. Okay? Um, and both of these approaches uh, represent behavioral therapies for uh, psychological disorders. So I'm going to talk first about um, uh, systematic desensitization. So in systematic desensitization, what you are doing is you're using classical conditioning, straight up classical conditioning, to recondition a new response with a feared stimulus. So for example, let me go to my whiteboard real quick. If I can go to my whiteboard. Can everybody see my whiteboard? Now, the first thing I need to do when you come into the uh, therapist's office is we come up with what's called a, uh, a, a uh, stimulus hierarchy. So let's say you're, you have a fear of spiders. Okay? What I need to do is come up with a fear hierarchy, which is a listing of exposures. Listing of exposures from what is bearable bearable to absolutely terrifying. So let's say you have a fear of spiders. I'll come in, and the first thing we do the first couple of days of therapy is come up with a listing of exposures to spiders. So it might be the word spider. You know what? It might be if you see the word spider written on the uh, board, it kind of makes your stomach crawl a little bit. And then there might be a picture of a spider. Right? Then a stuffed animal spider, then a dead spider, 
in a glass, in a live spider, in a glass, and then a live spider on your hand. Okay, that represents a fear hierarchy. It's a list of presentation of the feared event, okay, going from something you think you could bear to something that you absolutely uh, would freak you out, all right? And so what we do in the first couple of uh, uh, treatment uh, meetings is we're going to develop this fear hierarchy, and then I'm going to teach you how to relax. We're going to practice a relaxation technique where you can lower your heartbeat, get your breathing steady, and get calm. Okay, so I'm going to teach you how to relax. And then what we do is we begin exposing you to objects in the, uh, in the fear hierarchy while having you practice your relaxation technique. So the first thing I might do is call you into the lab, have you relax and do your breathing, breathing technique, and then I would write the word spider on the board. And you would try to remain relaxed. <sighs> Now, if you start to get up tight, you say, Chris, I'm starting to get up tight, and then I erase the board. All right? I erase the board. And then what we do is we go back, and I get you to relax again. And you go into your breathing technique and lower your heart rate, and then I write the word spider up again. And if we practice that long enough, if we practice that long enough, you'll be able to relax uh, while the, looking at the word spider. Once you've mastered that, we try the same thing with a picture of a spider. Once you master that, we practice uh, with a stuffed animal spider. Once you master that, we work with a dead spider in a glass. And do you see how that works? And what we do is we go up each step in your fear hierarchy. Now, truth of the matter is, if you're uh, deathly afraid of spiders, there's probably no way I'm ever going to get you to hold a spider in your hand. But what we want to do is we want to reduce the negative responses to the feared stimulus. And this is a great way to treat people who have simple phobias, okay? And so what we do is we replace the old response of the feared object, which is arousal, with the new response, which is relaxation, okay? Now, exposure therapy is, when, is a general term talking about causing the client to be exposed to the feared object and then what you do is <laughs> you talk them through their fears so they can associate a new, less arousing emotion with the feared object. So what we do um, is what we do is we sit down with the person, we talk about their fear, maybe fear of spiders or fear of clowns, and we have them talk about uh, their fear. And usually most people can explain why their fear is ir irrational. Okay but they can't control it when the object uh, is there. So what you do as a psychologist is you sit down with the person, you talk about their fear, you talk about, if I was to expose you to this feared object, what would you feel? And then we talk them through what was going to happen after that fact, right? And so the person would say, I'm gonna get really scared, right? But after a while, you're gonna realize that it's not harmful and you're going to calm down. And typically the person won't believe it. But what we do is uh, we can uh, talk them through it beforehand when they're relaxed, and then we put them in front of the feared object, the fearful the object that scares them, and then support them as they go through their ar arousal experience. I know that probably isn't the best uh, explanation. What I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is I'd like to show you a short video of a lady who is being treated for uh, clown phobia, clown phobia, using uh, this exposure therapy. Okay, so I'm going to switch to my screen share. Hope everybody can see this. Tell me how the sound goes. This is exposure therapy uh, used to treat. Coulophobia, which is the fear of clowns. All right, here we go. I'm 
suffered with this my entire life, and it's kind of a joke in the family. We all kind of laugh about it, you know, and, um, but it's embarrassing to tell people, I can't go to circuses. I can't go somewhere where there's clowns, even a picture of it. Call that a clown? That's a gesture. That, so that doesn't scary. bother you. So that, does that count as a clown? You can give me numbers, zero to 100. How about this guy? I have 50. You ready? This one's kind of scary. Oh, God. Go ahead and take a look at it. What's going to happen if you look at it? Nothing. All right, let's take a look. Stare at it. Good. Can you give me a number? <laughs> You're looking. You're doing fine. I can't it's okay. You're doing okay. You're doing fine. Stay with it. It's gonna be a big room. There's about four or five people in there. How big room? Like that size? About that size. Yeah. Probably a little bit bigger. Is okay. the clown gonna be in there? The clown's in there? Yeah. We're gonna walk in. We're gonna take a seat. I can't walk in with a the clown there. I'd what's rather gonna be, happen? I'd rather be sitting there and have him come in or something. Okay, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna leave. Why? Because I don't think I'm ready for this. I'm prepared but for this. What's gonna happen if there's a clown in the room? Is he gonna hurt you? No. Okay, are you gonna have a strong physical reaction? Yes. Have you had that before? Yes. Okay. Stay put. I'm gonna tell his name is Mr. Giggles. What? His name is Mr. Giggles. He's a clown. Hang on a sec. We'll go get him to move. Chris keeps her stuffed animal parsley close by for comfort. Okay, let's do this. Psychology students and a few of their friends have volunteered to participate so Chris won't have to face the clown one on one. Just have a seat. I'll go get him. Okay, here we go. All right, ready. Head on in. Hi everybody, I'm Mr. Giggles. How's everybody today? Good. Doing well. Ready. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to sit down right here, and I think we're all going to learn how to make some I'll start. Bloom dog. Bloom dog is the first thing they teach you how to make them when you go to clown school, kids. And like I told all the other kids, everything you got to learn how to do, you got to do in school. Great job. Does anybody here know how many heads the dog should have? No. Dog has one head. How many years does the dog have? Two, that's right. And nose is too long or too short. Because whatever kid you give us to is going to say this. Stay with it. All right, we have one kid here who's going to catch up here. Are we catching up? Okay, we need, we need. Now, what you're looking at, you have a dog with two ears. All righty. Doing fine. Okay, kids, now we're going to do the same thing we did before. All this is is the same thing over and over again. While we're holding on to the first bubble, we're going to go ahead and we're going to make another one. So now it looks like this here. But don't worry. As she keeps her eye on the clown, Chris's anxiety begins to lift. So if you never, ever, ever try HelloFresh, they have three different options. So, did you see how uh, incredibly terrified she was and how the doctor sort of walked her through, either, even before the experience, what was going to happen? And then he sat right there beside her as she was experiencing this fear, and he helped scaffold her and make her feel comfortable till her feel normally. Uh, well, if you'll, if you'll see, Ryan, at the end of that, she started to relax. At first, she was screaming and hollering and crying, and her eyes were closed, and she was all clenched up. But after a while, she started to relax because she got through the strong initial negative response. And so the idea is for her to learn that this fearful response is not going to hurt her. Okay? So... So... Um, if you think about it, so we've got systematic desensitization, which is really quite behavioral, if you will. And what you do is you walk up the uh, fear hierarchy, right? You walk up the fear hierarchy while, while trying to stay relaxed, while trying to stay relaxed. On the other hand, 
With exposure therapy, this is a little more cognitive because I know you're going to have the fearful response. And what I do is I explain to you what that response is going to be and how it's going to wax and wane, you know, get worse and get better. And then what I do is I expose you to the thing that really scares you and I sit there beside you and help you get through that initial fearful response. So systematic desensitization and exposure therapies are great ways of treating phobias. Now, uh, the third technique is called exposure and response prevention, and this is often used uh, uh, for people treating uh, bipolar disorders. Uh, quick comment on Bola, yes. Uh, it, I think this definitely is going to help her uh, get over her fear of clowns a little bit. Now, the next time she goes out and she doesn't have that psychologist with her, she's probably going to have a negative response. The question is, can she fight through uh, that negative response and let that fear drain away from her? See, what happens if she sees the clown and freaks out and runs away while she's still having the fear response, then she hasn't gotten anywhere. But if she just lets the fear sweep over her, she'll notice that it won't take as long to go away next time. And then the third time she sees a scary clown, she'll have an even less extreme response and it'll go away even quicker. And after four or five responses, uh, pairings with the clown, she might not even have a negative response. Right? So, uh, now, if you remember we were talking a little bit uh, on Thursday, Wednesday about psychological disorders. One psychological uh, anxiety related disorder is called obsessive compulsive disorder. And usually what happens is people have obsessive thoughts and these obsessive thoughts lead to uh, compulsive behaviors. So I might have the com obsessive thought that somebody's going to attack me. And every time I have that thought, I have to check the locks in my house to make sure my house is locked so I, somebody won't break into my house and kill me. And so I have that obsessive thought a hundred times a day, which causes me to engage in the compulsive behavior of checking my locks a hundred times a day. I might have the obsessive thought of, uh, that I'm going to get sick and die. And every time I have this obsessive thought that I'm going to get sick and die, I engage in a hand-washing behavior to protect myself from uh, getting sick. So this obsessive thought leads to this compulsive behavior. And so obsessive compulsive disorder occurs when a person has an obsession which leads to a compulsive behavior over and over again, hundred times, hundreds, maybe even hundreds of times a day. And if you remember, we talked about the criteria for psychological disorders. This can be very self-defeating, this can be very anxiety-producing, and this can be odd and eccentric. All three are characteristics that your doctor might look at and say, yes, this is a problem that needs to be treated. And so exposure and response prevention uh, is one therapy that can be used to treat people uh, with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And what you're trying to do here is break the link between the obsessive thought and the compulsive behavior. And so what I do is I bring you into the office and expose you to the stimulus that creates the obsessive thoughts. Maybe looking in the mirror and seeing your wrinkles causes you to think about death, which causes you to wash your hands hundreds of times a day. So every time you see yourself or think about your gray hair, you think about dying, which causes you to go wash your hands. And so what I would do is I would bring you into the lab and I would put you in situations uh, that cause your obsessive thoughts or your anxiety. And then what we would do is we would practice stopping the behavior. So I would cause you to think about this, but I wouldn't let you get up and wash your hands, right? We might be at your house and I might use the stimulus that causes you to think that somebody's going to attack you, but we make you sit down and refrain from uh, in from uh, uh, the compulsive behavior. And so this is sort of a, a, a classical conditioning response that we're trying to break up. You have the compulsive thought causes the compulsive behavior. What I try to do is break the link uh, between these two behaviors. Now, uh, if you look right below me, one of the things that they do uh, evaluate 
is how successful a treatment uh, is in um, in keeping you uh, in making you better. So uh, some therapies don't necessarily make anybody better, and in fact, uh, psychodynamic and humanistic theories sometimes don't work much better than no therapy at all, right? So really, uh, your insurance company is only interested in paying for therapies that have some sort of effect and are cheap. Now, drug therapy is very cheap, much cheaper than a uh, three or four uh, meetings with a psychologist. Your psychologist probably wants 250 bucks an hour, whereas you can get a whole set of pills for 60 bucks a month. And so, if it it's it's meeting four times with your therapist for a thousand bucks or getting a sixty dollar bottle of pills, your insurance company is more interested in paying for the cheaper pills than they are the therapy. However, uh, pills don't always work as good as psychotherapy. And you know what? Pills don't work as good as psychotherapy and some sort of medication. And so you look right here uh, below me, you'll see a graph which shows you uh, the reduction of symptoms related to just using uh, a medication for obsessive compulsive disorder or using uh, 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 exposure and resp response prevention therapy or uh, exposure and response prevention plus a drug therapy. And so the, uh, the blue line represents a placebo, which is no therapy. And you'll notice that if a person uses the antidepressant, their symptoms, their compulsive behavior goes down just a little bit. But if the person uses exposure and response therapy, their uh, uh, negative symptoms, their obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors drop way down compared to the placebo. And really, there's not much gain from adding a tricyclic to that exposure and response therapy. So what you can see here is a relative efficacy comparison of exposure and response prevention compared to just using drug therapy to treat a psychological disorder. As I suggested earlier, some therapies like psychodynamic and humanistic therapy, okay, if you compare them, their line won't even get any bit better than the placebo, the blue line we see here at the top. And so your insurance company is interested in paying for what is cheap and what is and what works, what is efficacious, all right? Any questions so far? And those are more behavioral. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, or, or CBT, um, is sort of different because it puts more emphasis on thought patterns. Now, these thought patterns are learned through, uh, through uh, uh, classical and operant conditioning. But the whole point of CBT is that these thought patterns then take on a life of their own and grow and become even more problematic and spread throughout our life. Uh, this is the most popular form of talk therapy and it's an outgrowth of, uh, of what we call reciprocal determinism. This idea that there's a link between your thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, right? So uh, here's the deal. If your parents, every time you engage in a behavior, if your parents told you you did it wrong and you did it poorly, that would cause you to have negative emotions. You'd feel sad, which would affect the way you think. You would then develop the belief that you're a loser, right? And then whenever you get a chance to engage in something new, to try something new, the first thing you think is, no, I'm going to be a failure at this. And so you would quit trying new things, right? Sometimes people have a bad breakup, which is the behavior. It causes them to feel really sad. They relate to those emotions by saying, wow, I must be a really horrible romantic partner that can't find love. And that causes you not to go out and seek romantic attractions anymore, which then makes you even more depressed because you're even more lonely. So do you see how early experiences can affect your outcome? They, these behaviors and the out consequences can affect your feelings, which then affect your thoughts, which then affect your behavior, which then ultimately again affects your thoughts. And so if you remember thinking, uh, as I suggested to you, uh, your mind is composed of schemas. 
Schemas are concept networks that help you organize information. It's shortcuts. When I say the word cir circus, five or six images pop into your mind. These are learned habits of thinking. So if I say circus, you probably thought elephant, clown. You certainly thought clown because we just talked about that. You might have thought tent. You might have thought dancing bears. You might have thought popcorn. And so thinking is a learned habit which may or may not reflect the reality and may or may not be helpful to you. How many of you have ever had a boss yell at you? Okay, I was umpire. I umpire baseball games on the weekend and this baseball coach was telling me that I was a worthless umpire. He, was, he just hated my strike zone and he just kept telling me that I was doing a bad job. And he, for all intents and purposes, was my boss yesterday. So my boss yelled at me. One way I could respond is to think, uh, I'm, I'm worthless. Man, he's right. I'm really not a very good umpire. And that might cause me to feel depressed. And I have to admit, it was sort of a bummer having somebody tell me I was horrible all day long yesterday. All right? Now, what I know as an experienced umpire is that I have to restructure the way I was thinking. My boss yelled at me. That baseball coach yelled at me. But my boss, that baseball coach, was having a bad day because his team wasn't playing very well. So really, the, pro the reason he was yelling at me is not because I'm worthless, but because he was losing the baseball game. And you know what? I felt a lot better when I realized that that's why he was yelling at me. So do you see how I can respond to those two different situations by reinterpreting, by differentially interpreting the event? So, Omar, you had a boss yell at you, right? And it's easy to take that personally and say, wow, the boss must be right. I probably am lazy, dumb, inefficient, or whatever. But if you can stop yourself and restructure and say, wait a minute, what's going on in the boss's life that might make them yell at me? That leads to a different emotion. So, my boss yelled at me. That's the behavior. Okay. Uh, I'm worthless is the thought, and then depression is the emotion, and then that emotion will then affect my thoughts later, which will affect my behavior later. Cognitive distortions are any automatic thoughts that people use to interpret events that are A, inaccurate, and B, psychologically impairing. Now, it's good to know when you're not doing a great job and when you need to fix your behavior. And so if you get a bad test on a, a bad grade on a test or a paper in school, that might mean that your performance needs to change or improve. Okay, and so that's, it might be accurate. Um, and you want to do better. But if people are just telling you your negative things about yourself, you might develop these inaccurate and psychologically impairing beliefs. What if there are many people who yell? Is it possible to overcome this? It's real hard. Uh, Kira, it is really, really hard uh, because sometimes by our behavior, we develop behaviors that actually invite uh, more people to yell at us. Um, and it really takes a lot of time with a therapist to develop these new thought patterns. You don't develop a thought pattern in one day, so you can't develop a new thought pattern in one day. This is why insurance money would rather give you a drug than psychotherapy. Like I said, they can give you a whole month's worth of pills for 50 or 60 bucks. But you may need to go see a cognitive therapist at 250 a pop once a week for six months. That's 24 times 250. Uh, that's $6,000 worth of therapy. You know, um, it does take a long time. However, uh, you can, it is a very useful way uh, because in the end, you don't want to be on the medication. You'd rather just develop the new more accurate thoughts. Now, there are lots of automatic irrational beliefs that people have. How many of you uh, have standards that you haven't met? You should be making all A's. You should have already finished college. You must uh, uh, make sure that you never make your boyfriend or girlfriend angry. How many of you feel like you're trapped under these things like musts and shoulds? I have to do this. I have students sometimes that tell me I have to make an A, right? Now, uh, there are a lot of people out there 
who always see everything that every negative thing that happens to them as the absolute worst thing ever. Oh my God, this is the worst ever thing that ever happened to me. Some people jump to conclusions. Your your uh, friend comes. Your friend doesn't give you a call one day at four o'clock when they say they will, and you decide that your friend doesn't like you and that you must have done something wrong. Maybe your friend's phone died. Maybe your friend got held up at work. But we jump to conclusions a lot. Sometimes. People have what's called all-or-nothing thinking. I'm either perfect or I suck, right? People don't realize it's okay to make an A- minus or a B plus. You don't have to be perfect. Some people don't see the good things that happen in their life. Instead, they focus on the negative things that happen in their life. You know what? Some people have this delusion that the world is supposed to be fair. It's not. And some people always uh, take things personally. Now, these are just some general automatic irrational beliefs that people have. And so what your CBT therapist is going to do is try to identify one or more of these irrational beliefs. And then what they're going to do is they're going to engage in cognitive restructuring. Okay? And that's learning how to interpret events differently. And so the first thing you have to do is become aware that you're using these irrational beliefs. And then you and I, as the therapist and client, would go through in my office and we would practice new responses. So I would have you imagine your boss yelling at you. I would have you imagine your romantic partner yelling at you. I would have you imagine your friend not calling you when they said they would call. And then what we do is we talk about more positive interpretations of the events that aren't quite as negative uh, towards you. And then what I want you to do is we would practice you learning how to notice when you're using these irrational beliefs and learn how to use these new interpretations. Real quick, I'd like to show you a quick video uh, of a fellow talking about how to uh, help a client uh, uh, identify when they're using these uh, cognitive distortions. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to my screen share if you don't mind. I'm going to cut off my audio real quick so you can hear the sound even better. Identifying automatic thoughts is an essential part of working in cognitive behavioral therapy. And the way that we access automatic thoughts can be simply noticing anytime there's a change of emotion, anytime that a person's expression, facial expression changes, or a tear comes to their eye and asking what went through your mind just when that happened. Uh, for some people, it might be more challenging. I've had uh, uh, people who said that I, I don't have automatic thoughts. I don't know what they would be. I, I don't know what's going through my mind. And in that case, my job, uh, you know, it can be to help elicit them. I have a patient for whom uh, she experienced anxiety, let's say, when uh, you know, there's soap on her hands and she and, and, and she notices that, and, and, and all she experiences is, is an immediate rush of anxiety. Well, I can uh, take her right into, and actually what I did, I took her right into the kitchen section of our building here and had her wash her hands right in front of me, leave a little soap on there. And I was able to access the automatic thoughts right in that situation because she was experiencing the distress in that moment. So I could ask her, what's going through your mind right now? More recently, I saw a gentleman who claimed that he did not have thoughts. He just felt miserable. He couldn't identify any specific automatic thought. But he could identify the emotion. In some ways, the emotions can be just a, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a shortcut for thoughts. But with him, I had him uh, detail what sensations he experienced. Where did you feel that misery? Uh, where did, you, did you feel it in, in, in your back? Did you feel it in your neck? Did you feel it in your head? And he's able to identify sensations. Muscle tension in his back, maybe heart rate increase, maybe a bit of general discomfort. And just by having him access those sensations, uh, he was able to identify what automatic thoughts were running through his mind right when he was feeling them. And then, of course, there's some people who don't think in words. There are people who think in pictures. And I can set an image that they have. Sometimes an image is worth a thousand words, but sometimes in watching whatever image is running through your mind, I can access uh, the automatic thought that way. A woman that I saw, um, even an artist, uh, had this image of this kind of when she made a mistake of this kind of grumpy, grumpy face, this expression on, on the face of a disapproving uh, authority figure, totally in her imagination. And that was the image in her mind. Different ways of tackling that. The automatic thought could be left as an image, or I can ask you, say, when you see that image, when you look at that image of that grumpy face, what runs through your mind right now when you see that face? Automatic thought, not good enough, or I failed. 
And then, with uh, even with an artist, I was able to even to access what alternate image, what ultimate uh, alternate uh, image could be an answer to that. Whether it's a, a a face of love, a face of nurturance, a face of kindness in response to that. So, so in short, there are many ways to access automatic thoughts. But if the person can't identify them when they come to see us, then we find ways to elicit those automatic thoughts right in session. Whether it's through sensations, whether it's through exposure, or whether it's through imagery. Okay, so that's a uh, clinical cognitive psychologist talking about cognitive restructure. And you'll notice he said that he has to help the client become aware of their use. These are habits, and a lot of times we don't even think about habits. So part of the clinical problem is identifying these habits of thought and then practicing the new interpretations in the psychologist's office. And by doing this, what the psychologist hopes to do is replace old learned and non-adaptive think habits of thinking with more adaptive, healthy, and uh, positive emotion-related uh, thought patterns. Okay? All right. That's all I had to say today. Does anybody have any questions? Did you, did you enjoy the videos? I'm going to start using videos from now on uh, in my class. I didn't realize how well they would work. Does everybody uh, have a good time? Remember, uh, there will be, Wednesday's lecture will be recorded. I have a doctor's appointment, so I will not be able to uh, have the live lecture on Wednesday. It will be a recording, okay? There will be a recording for the lecture on Wednesday. Great, I'm glad everybody liked it. Uh, and Ryan, I read that book you sent me. Uh, if you want to text me at some point later this afternoon, I'd be more than happy to chat with you about the book. Oh, goodness me. I tell you what, I will put the final review, I will make the final review available by tonight at 11.59 p.m. in the exam folder, uh, Kira. That's a good, that's a very good question. All right, if nobody has any questions, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, goodbye for the afternoon. Have a great day and, uh, uh, and good luck on the homework in the exam. Take care. Mm -hmm.